by. They be the king high. Now, what y'all won't do? Wanna be ballers? Big shot paper callers. Welcome to the Paper Caller Show. My name is Adam Young, the founder of Ringba. And today I have two very special guests, Kevin DiVincenzi and Thomas Coolidge. Kevin is the CEO of Rapid Response Marketing, a growing agency in Las Vegas, Nevada, and Thomas is his VP of Business Development. Thank you guys so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you, Adam. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Adam. We appreciate it. So you guys run an agency, and that's a model that the industry for paper call is rapidly moving towards. So can you guys give me an overview of how agencies in the paper call space actually function? Yeah, Thomas. Yep. So as an agency, uh, our main goal is to come up with a multi-channel marketing effort on behalf of the client that isn't necessarily hyper-focused on a cost per call scenario or a paper call scenario. Obviously, we have, um, we have the goals that a client wants to hit. So basically, as a client comes aboard, you start going into understanding what analytics they hopefully know, which... Uh, if you've been around the business long enough, you realize that a lot of people do not understand their cost for acquisitions. Uh, they usually only understand their top line stuff. Like I can tell you what I pay for a lead, what I pay for a call. I can tell you if I'm profitable, maybe after 30 days. But if you dive deep into the, the analytics, um, not surprising to me, but it's surprising to many people as they don't know the numbers. So as an agency, you're going, hey, what's your goal? What's your cost for acquisition goal? What, what, do you, what are you looking to accomplish? And then as an agency, we're going great. Here's, we start looking at all the different channels that we can combine to hit their goals with the understanding of, okay, listen, if you do uh, uh, Google only calls, that's one channel. That one channel is gonna represent X percentage of volume. It's gonna represent X percentage of sales. And then you do the same thing with TV, radio, uh, even even straight lead gen through Google AdWords. And you start looking at all of these channels and you start looking at the experience and you start looking at the analytics of all of them. And, and, and I'm not tied to, I'm tied to threshold, but not necessarily defined paper call. So if they said, hey, I go, listen, if your paper call threshold is as high as X, are you happy with that? As opposed to them coming to us and going, I got to hit a, a $65 call. It's got to be two minutes long. I don't care where it comes from. No matter what, I got to hit that number. As an agency, we're like going, that's not, we can't really help you there because you're going to suffocate us and we're not going to be able to do what we do best. So we'll say, hey, TV is going to come in at this rate. Radio is going to come in at this rate. Google call only is going to come in at this rate. We're going to do Google AdWords. You're going to get leads and calls off of that. It comes in here. And then when we combine that all together, we're going to hit their cost per acquisition goals and actually make them profitable. And we're charging agency rates. So we might do Google AdWords and charge, you know, a 25% agency fee. We might do um, TV and radio and only be at a 15% agency fee. But I'm not beholden to certain numbers they hit, but obviously I turn into an investment advisor and I'm spending your money like I would spend my money, which is, hey, you're gonna spend 10,000 a week or 5,000 a week or 100,000 a week I know that I have to get you an ROI of two to three to one in order for you to keep spending with me. So you have mutual incentivization uh, and kind of mutual destruction, which is if, the, if they go away, we lose out because now we have no revenue. If I win, you win scenario. Now, this type of model gets you closer to the actual direct buyer, right? As opposed to the brokers. We're, we, we work only with the direct buyer. So we try to create a, a high, high level of transparency where I'm really acting as your in-house agency for all intents and purposes. Awesome. I want to show, show you everything, right? I want you to tell me everything. Tell me this is shit. Tell me this is good. Tell me these calls work. This didn't work. Tell me what the, the ROI is on this because the more information you give me, the more I can help you. Um, and as you, you've been around long enough to know that information is key, and many, many, many campaigns fail because nobody gives you information. They're like, well, that's just shit. And you're like, well, okay, that doesn't tell me much. How can I fix it for you? Well, turn it off. Okay, well, that's not the answer I was looking for, but if that's all I can do, then I'll turn it off. But now, now I'm stuck, right? Whereas with a direct advertiser, 
they can give you the ins and the outs because it may be minor tweaking that really can affect the campaign dramatically. Well, so, I, oh, no, go ahead, Kevin. I was just going to say, I think a lot of, a lot of what happens in a client setup is interviewing the client first and understanding if it is a good fit, if they understand their metrics. So if they don't understand what their cost for acquisition should be, where they're spending their money, how they're backing out, if they don't understand any of that, or if it's paper call, if Thomas asks them, what duration do you need to qualify a client? And they go, oh, I don't know, just send me calls. Those are clients we normally shy away from because if they, we know we can't meet and exceed their expectations because they don't even have any. They, they don't understand their business. So that, that's, you know, that's quite a, quite a challenge in the marketplace because they might have found one thing that worked, one little niche that worked, and now they think they can just expand it, but it's not the way business works. So Thomas, you hit the nail on the head when you said we're more business consultants in that standpoint to make sure that A, it's a good fit for us, and B, they're getting the return that they're looking for on their, on their traffic. So it's... Do you typically see with direct buyers that they need a lot of education and that they don't fully understand all of their metrics? Absolutely. Uh, especially ones, our best clients are the ones that have in-house optimization teams <laughs> because they're not really driving to a real number. So they're driving their overall budget or they have, you know, they have a goal, well, we have to spend a half a million this month. That's great, but they're not driving to an actual number. So it's, it's, those are the clients that we're looking for, the ones that are very inefficient on their internal teams. And then you have to teach them the business and teach them how to write price traffic and teach them about the different traffic sources and everything. It's, it's a, it's a very, very intimate process going, <clears throat> working directly with an advertiser. But if you have the right one, it, it's great for everybody because everything's controlled. You can scale at a certain rate and everybody's happy. So what are some of the most painful lessons that you guys have experienced while working in the agency model and working with direct advertisers? Um, I'd probably say, well, there's, a, there's a few. Um, taking over existing internal accounts. They spoke about internal teams that are an absolute mess, but they want you to fix that. They, they want you to fix their account as opposed to just building it fresh. I mean, I'd rather take a client, let's say I was advertising Ringba, I'd rather take you on fresh, make a new Google MCC and start building it out myself and get my learnings as opposed to taking somebody else's mess, not understanding the methodologies and trying to fix what wasn't working already. So that, that's, that's probably the biggest lesson. So if we're getting a client that's like, oh, just take this over, it, it's, you know, you clinch your teeth and go, oh boy, here we go. Um, and then as far as paper call, I think that the biggest lesson it is understanding that you have to understand the qualification time. So, you know, you saw it, Adam, a lot of guys would come up and be like, just give me raw calls. And they don't understand that the raw calls are going to be absolute garbage, but that's what they want because they think it's a lesser cost. You know, I always say we're well, a stake in the lobster of, of the industry. So if you want McDonald's, go to McDonald's, but then you're using your staff time, you're using your resources for data that doesn't work. I'd rather give you the exact data that you're looking for and the exact consumer that then give you a bunch of garbage at a lower price. So and if, it, and if it backs out, if they're transparent with us and you can and you can look at their numbers, if they're backing out and they're hitting their goals, then the price is not even relative at that point. It's just hitting that goal. Now, Thomas, you've done a whole bunch of television advertising over the years in an agency model. What are some of the lessons that you've learned while driving television call traffic? Yeah, so so um, to be frank, the the kind of the digital paper call scenario for me uh, has been, it, it is a little newer because when you're dealing with TV and or radio calls, you have a very high quality call. So the intent of that call is very high. Um, what I've noticed in the digital realm and why durations are important is because the quality and intent sucks. It really does. I mean, really, if I were to take a, a hardcore TV radio client and then I say, hey, listen, I'm going to get you these digital calls. And it kind of happened. It, it, it's transforming now. Early on, they're like, shit. They're like, all of a sudden, um, in like 2010, 2011, all my TV radio guys are going, hey, man, listen, your pricing is way too high for me on TV and radio. And I'm going, okay, well, what do you mean? Well, I get all this digital stuff for this price with this two-minute duration, 90-second duration. But what, but what all – buyers tend to do is look at top line numbers. So what they do is they go, man, that's a, that's a $50 call for two minutes and, and your TV stuff, $65 for two minutes. So one of the big problems is you have is if you're not familiar with TV and radio, you're going, listen, let's look at quality of call. What do I mean by that? I mean, quality of call relative to staffing, relative to conversion. So 
if you are running uh, a call center, which I have a lot of experience doing that as well, when you have a call center, and any call center guy will, will know what I'm talking about, there's a psychology to a call center. So let's just say you have five, 10 reps on the phone. Well, those five and 10 reps, there's a psychology. So you got to look at the call volume that they can have. So everybody looks at like your concurrency, right? So how many calls can I get at the same time and with the reps that I have? But sometimes what they fail to do is you got to look at your, your quantitative numbers. So, okay, great. All calls are not the same. And this goes back to understanding your, your really focusing on a cost per acquisition number. Because at the end of the day, if your cost per acquisition is 200 bucks, and I told you, hey man, Adam, I'm gonna get you all the $200 conversions you can handle. You'd say, I'll take that all day. You wouldn't care if the call costs you 200 or costs you 150 or 100, as long as it converts to 200, you're golden. So, but conversely though, if I said, hey, your cost per acquisition is 200, I'm gonna give you, uh, you know, 200, $200 $1 calls, you're going, that is still gonna to convert to your number, but then you don't factor in your actual labor costs. So you actually, you, there's a lot of opportunity costs that's not factored in. And with TV and radio, other uh, areas of concern are timing, which is why people like digital a little bit more because you have more control. So you kind of have to wait this out. Listen, I can get you radio calls or TV calls. Here's the deal. If I'm going on a big national spot, like Price is Right or Wheel of Fortune or something like that, where it has a very large viewership, the spots can be very expensive. You could, you could spend ten, fifteen, fifteen thousand dollars on one spot. Now, in order to do that, though, you have to have the personnel to take this volume of calls. So you have a lot of um, ebb and flow, and you have valleys and peaks with TV, which means that boom, a spot goes off. Uh, maybe you're doing national, and you have twenty, thirty, forty, a hundred, a thousand calls all at once. Now you have to be staffed up to take this immense amount of calls in a short period of time. But then guess what? Now you're not running anything for the rest of the day. And so your call volume tails off and now you have staff sitting there doing nothing. And this is why as an agency, we always preach a multi-channeled effort. Like, listen, I'm gonna get you TV calls. The TV calls represent X. You're gonna get X number of calls per day, but they, those are gonna be spread out. Whatever, 30 calls a day. You're open from uh, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. You're gonna get your 30 calls. Well. Now you gotta say, well, how much staff do you have? And what am I doing with the staff the rest of the time? That's where, okay, well, now we have to pepper in some digital calls that I can better control on an hour by hour basis because I need to keep your staff busy. And now I may have to factor in like, like leads. So I might actually, there might be, you know, you might have some leads coming in as well. So now this is where you start building up this multi-channel event and you have to work this through with a potential direct advertiser if they're novice to to just the, this business idea if you will and again we always say business consulting because boy it's more often than that we end up getting into and having to learn so much about your business just so we could be effective and it's a love hate thing because you're like wow it's cool i get to learn about your business but boy i really didn't want to have to help you run your business to do your marketing but it, got, it really goes hand in hand and if you want long-term clients, you're going to have to learn business and you're going to have to suck it up because that's really what you just to sit there and say, Hey man, uh, you know, back in the day, you could, you could do this. Hey, I'm just going to get you leads. You just want leads. You're going to pay this price and nobody gives a shit. And you, you know what? You could run a campaign for three, six, nine months, just doing that. They're just shipping you money. You're shipping them calls, no real communication. That was the early days. Well, guess what? The clients are a lot smarter now. They're a lot more educated. So you have a lot of guys out there going, Hey dude, I've been, this is all the ways I've been screwed this way, that way, fraud calls, bad calls, coach calls. I mean, there's a lot of fraud that's out there. So this is why we're seeing and why we're transitioning back to this more full service agency model is so that we can build everything in house. And then, Hey, once we have it in house, now I can go out to our extended family, if you will, and treat them more as media buyers and say, hey, here's all the metrics, here, here's all the data, I just need you as a media buyer. And now there's a lot more value there than just saying, hey man, I got a great offer, I'm gonna get 30 guys to run it and, and cross my fingers and hope, and hope it works out. Well, so I think that's a great segment into quality assurance. 
there's a lot of fraud and a lot of problems and issues that happen with calls because there's a real human on the phone. They happen in real time and um, it's not like a lead. And so what is your quality assurance process? What does it look like? And what's the hardest part about managing quality assurance that you guys see? It's mostly, I mean, we have a team that listens to each and every call on a new advertiser until our publisher is proven out. So it's just a, a time concern. And then us, myself or Thomas, re-reviewing any calls that, that are in question. So it's just betting through, it's just the time. Going back to Thomas's uh, last comments though, in regards to, uh, to, the, to knowing the advertiser's business, I feel so much more empowered though, knowing the advertiser's business so like, let's just say there's a, a client we just built up in the past eight months that we built everything for the client, his CRM system, his follow-up system, literally everything. But when I'm out there buying media like I was today for him, I know what all his costs are as well. So I know if he gets bad data, it's going to cost him six fifty dollars a box for his prepaid box to go out. It's going to cost him his staff time. Like I've got all his numbers, so I can be a lot more empowered. So when we are negotiating with a media buyer, we're talking basically on the client's behalf as opposed to just being like exactly as Thomas said, I have a lead, I have a call. It's, we understand the whole business, what we're looking for to get that quality. And this is what the actual process of building a campaign looks like on the back end for affiliates that maybe are just driving traffic today, but hope to eventually have their own direct advertisers. You really do need to understand their business and how it works and all the metrics so that you can get all of your payouts in place and all of the systems in place to actually take those calls. So guys, what are some of your favorite big wins? Where have you seen a lot of success in pay per call? Um, and where do you hope to find success as your business grows? Uh, we've, we're seeing a lot of success with uh, tax debt. And again, direct, direct clients that we're dealing with, uh, working very closely with the clients on what type of consumer they're looking for, getting feedback from their phone room of what's working in, in, in regards to the calls. Um, that, that's probably a big one. Student loan consolidation. We've been one of the guys that have survived for the past, you know, four or five years, even with all the changes. Um, but again, it's working with their rooms and understanding and listening. That's more not, not even listening to the affiliate calls, but listening to their phone rooms calls and then going back to, to the CEO or the managing director and saying, listen, you know, rep, you know, John is great, but Sally's terrible. You got to get rid of Sally because she's not doing a really good job on the calls. She's not treating the calls properly because, it's very easy for somebody on top to be like, yeah, as Thomas said, oh, they're all, they're all bad, throw them all out, as opposed to it could be something internal. So that's what we have to put on the business manager hat and help them with their business so they can streamline and they can, they can do things properly. So what does the business model behind tax debt actually look like? Thomas? Uh, so if you're a, again, this will depend on uh, your, the shop. Um, the actual client because uh, there is uh, I've done tax debt for a long time probably like 10 years but you have the guys that are just looking for the as much as they can get per client so they're looking for guys that have $10,000 or more in tax debt but money that they owe the IRS they want to get the highest amount of dollars that they can $3,500 $4,500 they want the high, higher the tax debt the more they're going to charge they don't always offer a lot of value there because they're just coming in. Hey, do you owe the IRS 10,000 or more in back taxes? If the answer is no, they're killing the call. They're getting them off the call. So they leave a lot of money on the table because they're just focusing on very high debt owed and they want to charge as much money for the, for the debt owed as possible. So that's one model. Uh, that's a model that's gone on for a long time. And if you've been around the game long enough, those companies are not sustainable. They're there and gone. They might be around for a couple years, but they're not building a long-term, you know, sustainable business model. The guys that are, what they do is every call works, right? And this goes back to, are you going to treat me as an agency or are you treating me just at a paper call based on a fixed price and a fixed duration? Because a guy that can take every call and potentially monetize it, he's not only asking, are you $10,000 or more in back taxes, but he's going, hey, do you have any other tax problems? Can I do tax preparation for you? Can I offer these additional services that in turn give me, in, give me more revenue, which will offset my marketing costs? So for example, if I have a, if, if in, in, our t, in our offline stuff, the ROI can be five to six to one. It's really big ROI 
very high intent and with the right, again, with the right sales center, sales floor, um, they can close these type of deals and they can get, a, and they can churn the revenue out of them. But they're, conversely, they're also taking the guy like, hey man, I, you know, I might only owe the IRS 5,000. Well, a lot of companies say, I'm not, even, I, I'm not gonna talk to you. Our guys will go, not a problem. Let, let's, let's see how we can actually help you. And maybe they're not a big ticket client, but from just a very customer centric point of view, you know what? Hey, I'm going to charge you, you know, 800 bucks or something or a thousand bucks. I can actually help you resolve the issue. I can actually uh, make your money back, meaning you owe 5,000. I could probably negotiate it down. Maybe we get a payment plan and now you owe 2,500. You paid us, a, you know, a thousand dollars or our fee. But after you add it all together, you still came under your 5,000. So, but that's in all businesses, right? So in all business, what are you doing and what are you offering that consumer that A, you can monetize almost anything that comes through the door. Uh, B, if you can't monetize it, you can refer it out to somebody that can help offset your marketing costs because maybe they give you a referral fee. Uh, or, you know, they give you something, a little something for the effort, right? Um, and C, are you smart enough to realize that when you have enough inquiries for a certain uh, offering or a ser certain service or product the consumer wants that you adapt adapt to the marketplace that you actually go oh you know what they're all calling in for this product right here guys why don't we create this offering let's come up with a pricing model and take advantage of this instead of your top line guy oh you know this absolutely doesn't fit it this is all we do and and they're done well i'll tell you what man you're not going to survive the marketplace listen clients are smarter marketing is getting tighter they're understanding that they can't afford to pay a huge they're understanding what it actually costs them to generate their own stuff in house uh, versus going to a broker or even some of these affiliate networks. And in, in essence, in, in, for all intents purposes, getting gouged in my mind, um, just, just know anybody out there that's in business, just understand that your client is getting smarter. So you, it's not that you need to get smarter. You just, you just, you just need to be wiser and just be like, okay, well, I, this is what the market's bearing. And are you willing to do work uh, for your client where maybe your margins aren't what they used to be, but you got to say, are you going to say no? Or are you going to take the margin that's there knowing, listen, if we take a smaller margin, but you're a client that I can grow and I can take you from, you know, $10,000 a month spent. And then after working six months with you, now you're at 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. That's a real business. That's taking a guy building up, building up their, uh, building up their marketing dollars. I mean, listen, we do a lot of legal advertising as well. And I can't even tell you how many campaigns we've done where like you slowly build up these marketing budgets and they start small, but you're willing to work with them. And next thing you know, they're spending, you know, six figures a month. And that's how you build a very long-term sustainable business. And I know Kevin can attest to this because he's done it plenty of times with various clients over his years. Yeah, I think a lot of it, Thomas, is like, let's take the, the tax clients a great example. The, ta the tax client was so flexible that after our, our, talking about one of our current clients, after the first week, if I recall, we were all excited when we were getting like the half million in debt leads and the $200,000 debt leads. And we're like, oh, this is great. And then he was kind enough to share all his internal numbers with us. And we found out his 7,500 in debt and below made more bottom line revenue, five to six X, right, Thomas? Yeah. Uh, five to six X revenue, as opposed to the bigger ones that, that he, he didn't close as many. So by him having the, the being an entrepreneur for, first and foremost, understanding, hey, I want all these calls um, and then turning them all into opportunity. And you can only do that managing a media buy. You can't do that as an affiliate because I understand from a paper call standpoint, sure, if I'm paying for a call, I want the best. I only want the, you know, the 20,000 or 10,000 and above in debt. But if you're, if you're managing the whole campaign, you'll take everything because you're paying for the spend. Um, and even when the uh, IRS uh, shutdown happened, Adam, a lot of IRS calls were coming in. And our clients were like, we'll take them. We'll take them because we'll see what opportunities on those calls. Keep sending those as well. You know, and, and you're not going to have that if, you, if you're on a strict just performance basis in regards to calls because they just don't want them. So it's a, it's a great opportunity. I have a bunch of clients that are either smaller agencies or affiliates that are growing their business. And I see a lot of them attack this across many, many verticals. It's very prevalent in finance, like tax and debt and other places, but 
Um, essentially where there's a qualifier for the call that the call center wants and they're unwilling to be flexible, like that $10,000 mark. Right. We have all these guys that are starting to realize, well, we can just take all the calls they don't want and monetize them in various ways and then build their own IVR qualifiers and then split off the calls and still monetize what the uh, unreasonable, we'll call it, call centers uh, won't take. And I actually have watched quite a few people over the last year build significant businesses by essentially just monetizing the garbage that no one else wants. Um, and I think that's a really key point, and I'm glad we highlighted it. You should never be giving away anything or throwing away anything. If there are lots of calls that just don't work for your advertiser and you have them, you really need to figure out how to monetize those calls because that alone can be a business in itself. And most people aren't willing to do the work. And so I always say that, like, if you're willing to outwork everyone else and try a bunch of things as an affiliate, you'll be successful because most of them are lazy and they're unwilling to do the work. And I see this, uh, what you just described as a, a massive opportunity. <laughs> There's a, I come, uh, cut my teeth in the call center industry and um, we would have no sell departments and no sell departments would eke out one to 3% in close rate. On, when I say no sell, I mean like, these are beat up leads. Like they said, they said no, you know, 10, 15, 20 times. You have a really good no sales department. They're like, oh, if they've only said no 20 times, that's like a fresh lead. Let's get it. So <laughs> you take a no sell and, and you can churn out another one to 3%. And, and I think um, another big issue facing actual clients is you're like, listen, there's been a lot of changes in Google uh, th that have been affecting the ability to get call volume. So now that's a very big channel for most everybody. So now changes are happening in the marketing space, which means in turn, you're going to get less volume. So what do you do? Guess what? You guys are going to have to fucking work again. You, you're going to have to train your staff to work harder, meaning that they're going to have to take all of these calls that come in, do, it, do the qualifier, turn them into a lead. And if they no sale, you better put them into some type, type of program a drip program where you're emailing, texting, and going back after those same people, just touching bases, maybe giving them newsletters, but you have to build up a program to reinsert yourself and become top of mind so that when that problem, issue, concern happens, you'll be the first person they call and you have to get the most out of your leads because I tell you what, there's a lot of verticals where because of compliance issues or because of just uh, the... Um, networks, if you will, not even allowing that type of advertising to happen, you have let a, a smaller pool of people you're going you're gonna to have access to. You're going to have to start looking at these multi-channel marketing scenarios, and you're going to have to really structure and really train your internal staff to pull the most dollars out of it. Because if you're just sitting there going, I'm going to get the, I've seen this show already. It was called pre-2008. There was guys just living off the cream, man. They're just it, they could get calls from anywhere, do whatever. I mean, boom, you know, they, they would burn so much. Can't help you, can't help you, close deal, and making money. Recession hit, now you actually have to work. You had no business model built up. You didn't realize you're living off the cream. Um, and some people legitimately, that happens because they, if you've never failed in business, or failed in life, what do you do? You repeat the same thing over and over again. Actually, it's called insanity. But you go, well, it's always been successful if I spent a million dollars a month on TV. Well, guess what? That shit's not working anymore. You haven't adapted. This is your first time failing. You don't know what it's like to fail. So you didn't change anything, and now you're not surviving. I'll tell you, this is happening right now. It's going to happen, especially over this next year. I think if, you're, uh, if you are an agency or a small agency, um, if you're an affiliate, uh, just get really good at understanding how to build and deliver your own traffic, understand where your traffic comes from, obviously always be testing, but um, you're going to have to become a little wiser, a little smarter, and guess what? You're going to have to do a little bit more work, and, and you better learn about the grind because the way to make real money in business is the grind. I mean, yes, you hear about the success stories, but that's all bullshit. Nobody tells you, hey man, 10 years ago, I, I cleaned the toilets, I cleaned the shower, I, you know, I lived off 99 cent of hot dogs before I made a dollar. But all they see is like, oh man, you're balling it up, you got a house, a car, and all of this. 
you're like, yeah, motherfucker, you didn't see all the shit I had to do to get right here. So yeah, it looks great now, but I promise you, I, it took a lot to get here. And then it takes even more to be very, very um, smart, put your ego in a little fucking box. And now you have to take care of yourself personally. And I see so many people fail because their personal finances absolutely slaughter them. They're like, well, I'm making money here. And you're like, dude, this money you're making here is what I'm going to call your home run years. Your real year, your real average is probably down here. You've adjusted your lifestyle to the top. Now this happens. There's, see that big gap right there? Mm -hmm. That's called debt. <laughs> and now you're eventually going to be like this upside down because you didn't make adjustments. And almost 99% of the time, I'm going to say and be on record here, your personal life and your personal expenses will make your business fail. Not the other way. Your business won't fail usually on its own. It's because you're, what you're doing personally is what makes your business fail. And it, it happens and it happens so many times and you try to tell young guys this and, and we've all been there. We think we know better. We're not saving any money. We're not prepared. And then it happens. And of course you got the shell shock face. Like, oh, this should happen. You're like, yeah, I've been trying to tell you that, that that's going to happen. You know, well, what you just said is entirely supported by the statistics of the affiliate industry. Like a six month affiliate is actually a dinosaur in the space. Most affiliates are in, they get a campaign that works and they're back out within six months. They either didn't save their money, they didn't well, plan, they didn't run a, uh, they didn't keep testing and grinding. They were like, Ooh, I made some money. Let me go have some fun. Um, and I, I mean, preach it, brother. That right there, I would say, is the number one mistake over the last 15 years. I've watched every single affiliate or person in performance marketing specifically make and then wash right out. They don't have the discipline or the normal business savvy to realize that they have to plan for the future. And in a space like this, it's not like owning a franchise. It's not so long term and sustainable. Campaigns will go up and down and up and down. And that's why, just like you uh, framed out there, it's really important to manage your finances. Just real quick on that. So I've, I've been mainly uh, in the legal space for like 10 years, uh, generated like over $2 billion in settlements, um, consumer settlements on behalf of these attorneys and probably made attorneys at least 600 million in fees. I can tell you last year was probably like the worst year ever just in the sense that there wasn't a lot of activity, there wasn't a lot of campaigns being, being ran compared to previous years. So, but I was prepared, I, I thought it was gonna happen the year before. So what did I do? What I did with, with what I suggested my partners do is really, really cut down all the personal finances, just really make, just, you know, make, make everything uh, so you're living below your means, which I kind of do anyway. I learned that, I think we've all learned that over time but I really prepared and you know what? I made probably the least amount of money I've ever made in the last like um, 10 or 12 years last year. And I had the best year ever. I hung out with my son. I still traveled a little bit. I just, uh, I did everything at a lower level. So, you know, maybe instead of the, the, the $400 hotel room, you have the hundred dollar Airbnb who gives a shit, right? Who, like big whoop, uh, you know, maybe you bought the first class ticket, you buy the coach ticket uh, and you're, you're flying spirit airlines and you have a sore back when you get off the plane, whatever. The point is, is that you can still have these amazing, you can still have an amazing life and you can still do all the things you want to do. You just don't have to spend at the level just cause you think it looks good. You know, it, it can be done people just, you can, you can done it. Just um, sometimes you just can't give a shit about how, how it looks. You got to do your thing, but, but, you definitely don't have to have that lavish lifestyle because I'll tell you one thing, money will come and go, mostly go, and it spends way faster than you'll ever earn in your whole life. You can make $5 million today and spend $10 million, trust me, a lot faster. Uh, and Adam, I think it's a lot of it is, you know, when you talked about the, the short-term affiliates or the six-month affiliates, it's not understanding what your un unique selling proposition is or understanding why you're even in the deal. So affiliates will come in, they'll copy something that works. And it's like, yeah, I'm making all this money, but they've never even sat down to understand a business case as to why a deal is working and what their value add is. So by the time that deal goes, they have no idea how to replicate it. That's why, you know, if we get 
people copying our ideas all the time. It's like, it's okay, they can copy that because once that source runs out or once something runs out, they're done. They can't evolve. So you, you, have, you have to constantly evolve. You know, it's my, my old saying, adapt or die, right? You have to keep on evolving in this business. Otherwise, you're, you're, there's no longevity to it. And a lot of these affiliates that are doing pay-per-call, they rely on the network for their tracking. And that works in clicks. That's okay with clicks. But in calls, it just doesn't work. If you don't have your own third-party tracking and you're not getting all your data and you can't route your phone calls to different buyers and have control over your business, you're destined to wash out. Because half the stuff that Thomas talked about that you guys are doing to help your partners monetize their back-end business is all reliant on technology. And so if an affiliate is not using their own technology, um, whether it's Ringba or somebody else, honestly, I don't care. They need to use it. Otherwise, they have no control over their destiny. That's a great point because now they're just putting all their trust into the either network or the advertiser. So they have no idea if any scrubs are having on the back end, what filters are in place, you know, what the, you know, all, all these different things are, you know, if it was a web lead, what the cookie life is, if it's a last click attribution, a first click attribution, there's so many different levels. And believe it or not, a lot of times that's the margin. That's a 20, 30% margin sometimes on a call qualifying or not qualifying. And if you're doing a sizable number, it's, it could be your whole bottom line for the campaign. So it's really, really important to understand how something tracks and track it all the way through. And as Adam said, have your own tracking platform. Don't rely on a third party because then you're pretty much, you're, 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 uh, you're hostage to them. So if you're, if you're running, let's say a tax campaign with one advertiser, you're not using your own tracking. If that advertiser goes out of business, you might have this great campaign. You can't even move it. So at least if you set up, like we're set up, if, if we lost one, we could just move over to the next guy, move over to the next buyer. You're, not, you're never stuck where you're married to that one partnership or that one opportunity. So it's, it's planning, planning ahead of time. Exactly. And I think that ties into everything we've discussed, planning ahead and thinking about your future, where the business is going, using the available resources to actually provide value to people. That's really what the agency model versus an affiliate actually is. It's about actually building something of value and providing it to your clients. And that's why I like the call space a lot because it's a requirement. You have to provide that value to your client, otherwise you lose them. And so there's no nonsense whatsoever. How do you guys think your business will change over the next few years? I think, I, well, I think I know that we're moving just into more of the agency standard in regards to managed Google campaigns on paper call and on leads and just dealing directly on building businesses out as opposed to any brokering deals. Like we don't broker deals anymore. We don't take anything from a third party because it just doesn't make sense because we, we feel that even if we did a bang up job for a third party, we're never going to get the credit nor get the proper compensation for doing that because we'll be mixed in with everybody else. So we'd much rather have that relationship direct and it just, it works for us because it, it's, it, there's a lot more money on the table. Advertiser gets a lot more feedback and it's just, it, it's pretty much replaced their marketing team would be, would be our goal for, for a lot of these guys and do it more efficiently. Well, guys, it was a pleasure to have you on the show today. If people want to get in contact with Rapid Response Marketing and do business with you, how can they get a hold of you? Well, you have uh, my, my, uh, my cell phone hasn't changed in 25 years, <laughs> so they can, they, can always, uh, they, they can always call me on my cell phone. Um, and uh, up on the site, rapidresponseonline.com or rrm.llc, probably easier to remember. That's our main site that'll have all our contact information, Thomas's direct lines and everything else. Yeah, we have live chat, call the phone number on the, on the website, rapidresponseonline.com. Um, and we're pretty much 24 seven, so. Awesome, well, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for watching the Paper Collar Show. Let us know what you think by joining the conversation and commenting below. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe. And if you're on mobile, tap the bell. Whether you're new to Paper Call or an industry veteran, we invite you to join the free community at papercallers.com. This episode of Paper Callers is brought to you by Ringba Call Tracking and Analytics. See how Ringba is inventing the future of calls at ringba.com. See you next week.